Okay, we should get started in the interest of time. Um, I'm Peter Andreas. I have a joint appointment here uh, at the Watson Institute in the Political Science Department, and I run the Security Seminar Series, of which this is the first talk of the semester, I believe, in the series. And <coughs> it's my great pleasure to um, welcome Winifred Tate back to Brown. We were just doing the math and realized it was 10 years or so that she was a postdoctoral fellow here at the Watson Institute. Uh, and uh, so time does fly. We didn't quite realize how long it had been. And at that time, as I recall, she was just getting going on this, on this project. Um, she subsequently got a job um, teaching at Colby College, where she's an assistant uh, professor. Uh, and this is her second book. Uh, in some ways, this is a, um, a book tour. Um, so it's a clever title, which you know I was particularly pleased with. Drugs, Thugs, and Diplomats, U.S. Policymaking in Colombia. And it already has rave reviews. One blurber on the back of her book wrote, here's the book we've been waiting for to help us make sense of the much debated plan Colombia. From the national security bureaucracy in Washington to the coca fields in Colombia, Tate's fascinating account is a model for how to do ethnography of foreign policymaking. Peter Andreas, Brown University. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a fan of the book. Uh, and so I said, hey, we should get her to Brown uh, to give a talk on it, since I uh, uh, want to hear her uh, uh, presentation. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Winifred. So I'd like to thank um, Peter Andreas for the invitation. Um, and to come back to the Watson Institute, uh, it's kind of shocking that it's been a decade. Uh, but I'm very happy and think it is particularly fitting to be talking about this book here because this book really started as a book here um, with the conversations I had with my colleagues as a postdoctoral fellow um, while I was here at the Watson. I'd also like to thank the Latin American Studies Program. and. Um, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to share the ideas. This is somewhat, uh, this is the beginning of my book tours. Um, so far, the only other stop I have scheduled is the U.S. Army War College. <laughs> so I'm thinking that'll be a little bit of a different crowd. But I'm looking forward to that opportunity as well. Um, so today I'm going to be dividing my talk into two parts. Um, what does an anthropologist think about policy? What are we doing as anthropologists thinking about policy? Or why do an anthropology of policy? And then I'm going to be talking about the Colombian paramilitaries um, and how these groups were both a policy problem and a policy solution. And really look at, on the local level in rural Colombia, what was the work that official policy towards paramilitaries did? And because I'm an anthropologist, I'm going to start with a reflexive recounting of how this project emerged. Um, so a decade before I even was a postdoctoral fellow here, more than a decade before, I was a policy analyst in Washington. And I worked at the Washington Office on Latin America, WOLA, which is a small human rights advocacy group. And I began working there in 1998 as their Columbia expert. And at the time, without knowing it, I got lucky because US officials were in the process of preparing a major aid package for Columbia that became known as Plan Columbia. And this package was passed in the year 2000, about $1.2 billion um, for Colombia. And this aid was going to help Colombia do it all, reduce drug trafficking, defeat leftist guerrillas, support peace, build democracy. But more than 80% of this assistance was military aid at the to a time when Colombian security forces were linked to abusive drug trafficking paramilitary forces. And so I worked at WOLA for about three years as Plan Colombia was designed and implemented. And my job was lobbying policymaking officials, explaining US policy to activists around the country, US activists, and researching political violence and illegal economies in Colombia. But as I worked, I saw the contradictions between the bland platitudes issued by US officials at their staged press conferences and the material resources, helicopters, miniguns, chemical herbicides, that were being sent to Colombia through this plan. And I did not see the proposals, hopes, or experiences of the targets of this policy in southern Colombia reflected in the policy formulations. So I began to question both what I observed and what I participated in. So trying to ask myself, what exactly is policy? How does it get made? 
what constitutes successful policy and how it, are these assessments generated? And these questions took me back to Washington, but now as an ethnographer, as an anthropologist, instead of an advocate. And I began thinking about policy as an object of anthropological analysis. I sat in on congressional hearings. I read declassified government documents, interviewed congressional aides, my former colleagues, military officials and civilian contractors at the Pentagon and the U.S. Southern Command headquarters in Miami. That was a tough trip. I now teach in Maine, so I was like, I have to go to Miami in January to interview some military officers <laughs> um, and embassy personnel in Bogota. And I also went to Southern Colombia, to Putumayo, a southern state, where Plan Colombia was first unleashed. And there I listened to a very different set of policy actors. I listened to coca farmers and remote villages attended community forums with small town mayors and joked with priests. In this book, I argue, you can hold it up again if you will, <laughs> I argue that foreign policy is not a discrete fixed plan for future political action. Rather, policymaking consists of producing narratives that justify political action in the present and unite disparate bureaucratic projects. Um, I argue that policy narratives play a central role in making political action legible, coherent and comprehensible to the public, but also to officials working within these different government bureaucracies. So an anthropology of policy asks not, is policy successful, but what does it do? What work does it do? And so the first thing that I think anthropologists are particularly interested in is how policy makes particular social relationships, identity, and practices into policy problems that require institutional intervention. So anthropologists argue that policy problems do not exist but must be created through what Susan Greenhall calls policy problematization in order to manage, regulate, and shape both individual action and collective, uh, and collective social life. And this process necessarily involves production of knowledge about what these problems are, um, specific forms of expert knowledge. And these domains shift over time. And so the terms of what knowledge is labeled expert, how it's situated, celebrated, incorporated, or excluded into policy discourses and practices is also something that I'm very interested in tracing. Um, and particularly what is excluded. So what is viewed as not official authorized expertise and what people are not interested in knowing about. Strategic ambiguity is also critical in the policy making process because it provides the appearance of institutional coherence and consensus among disparate programs, allowing distinct and even substantially contradictory programs to appear part of a seamless unified initiative. Because a central part of policy making is actually to generate alliances and support among competing bureaucracies for particular forms of political action. So understood this way, policy is a state effect. It's not produced in anticipation of government action, but through the recategorization of existing programs, um, existing efforts at governance and state relations. And this strategic ambiguity also limits dissent and opposition because any kind of critique can be met with, well, we're not actually doing that, we're doing this other thing over here under this broad umbrella of these kinds of programs. Anthropology of policy also attends to the ways in which policy mobilizing discourses work in myriad spheres, um, expanding what Susan Greenhall calls policy assemblages from the phase of policy problemization to also practices of implementation and assessment. So in this case, I analyze a broad political field that includes different governmental agencies ranging from the State Department, the Pentagon, um, to military forces, NGOs, congressional staff, peasant fighters, uh, peasant farmers, <laughs> guerrilla fighters, paramilitary warlords, and solidarity activists. So all of these people are acting in very different social worlds, but are contained within the same political field. Um, and dissecting the role of these assemblages in policy making requires examining how policy is made through bureaucratic encounters. So that moment of interaction between um, officials and citizens. Additionally, policy making involves emotional work. So ethnographic research reveals how both oppositional activists 
the people we're usually thinking of as the emotional ones, the impassioned ones, but also policymaking officials locate the origins of their policy practice in emotional transformations and commitments. So policymaking is frequently imagined as dispassionate, rational assessment of what a, of a given situation. But here I argue that policy mobilization involves the opposite, emotional commitments couched and explained in terms of affective relationships um, and emotional entanglements, passionate obligations um, of policymakers in their effort to orchestrate tra uh, transformation abroad. So I'm working on, uh, building on the work of a lot of anthropologists of emotion, including Kathy Lutz, um, who's here at Brown, critical and feminist international relations theorists. Um, and the particular case that I focus on in the book is congressional delegations, the drugs and thugs tours, and the ways in which congressional staff are encouraged and do identify with the masculine heroes um, within the Colombian counter-narcotics police and the Colombian soldiers. And I'm particularly interested in expanding our understanding of how solidarity is imagined and enacted, drawing on moral landscapes engendered through this kind of travel and embodied in commemorative acts. So who is memorialized? Who is mourned? Um, and this seeing that solidarity is really um, works across political fields. So it's not just something that leftist opposition people um, practice. But it's really um, part of our entire political imagination within the United States. That solidarity is really based on um, how we imagine who we are supposed to connect to, who we are supposed to protect. And how we do that is imagined as both a burden and a noble birthright. Reproducing global racial and class hierarchies through the calculus of who is to be helped, who is to do the helping, and how that help is constituted. Um, so rather than being understood as a particular form of oppositional political expression, solidarity is a fundamental structuring logic of US political culture, and a central way in which Americans believe themselves to be acting in concert with transnational, transnational political projects in other countries. In other words, solidarity can be a justifying logic inter of intervention, and certainly has been across many cases in Latin America. Anthropology of policy is also very concerned with broadening the political field to include the targets of policy intervention, their political allies, and others who are excluded from um, official debates. And these targets are never this, um, the empty receptacles of such interventions, but actively contest them, shape their outcomes, and produce alternatives. So in the case of Plan Colombia, U.S. activists and advocates, Colombian local officials, community leaders, um, and coca farmers all attempted to participate in policy production through protests, lobbying, and producing alternative policy visions, despite being criminalized and excluded. And I argue have a very significant role in how Plan Colombia um, was actually um, implemented on the ground. And finally, anthropologists are concerned with documenting how policymakers get local logics wrong. <laughs> so not just thinking about policymaking as a cultural field, but also arguing um, that we need to be attuned to the inaccuracies of official policy formulations. And anthropologists who work in many of the areas that are targeted by different kinds of policy interventions can often speak to that. And I argue that foreign policy in particularly particularly necessarily obscures and misrepresents the events in the regions um, that are being focused on by such interventions. So I'm not going to talk in depth about the methodological challenges of doing this work, but I'm happy to address that in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to turn now to analyzing a central issue during the Plan Columbia debates, um, which was categorizing and accounting for Colombian paramilitary violence in the context of escalating U.S. military assistance. Um, so as I said, these paramilitary groups were both a policy problem and a policy solution. <clears throat> escalating violence was a policy problem, so massacres, assassinations, death threats, highly visible factors in Colombian instability. At the same time, paramilitaries were a policy solution. 
because many people in Colombia thought you needed brutal counterinsurgency violence as a foundation of rolling back increasing guerrilla strength in many parts of the country. Um, so I'm going to begin by thinking a little, uh, talking a little bit about the state of paramilitary violence in the years leading up to Plan Colombia. So during this period, Colombia was seen as a country in crisis, and there were many things going on, an economic crisis of um, negative growth, uh, the political crisis of the Sam Per administration, the president had been accused of receiving campaign contributions from the Cali cartel. Um, the country became the source of most of the world's coca for the cocaine trade. But by far the most important indicator for crisis um, for most middle and upper class Colombians and U.S. and Colombian officials was fear of escalating attacks from the guerrillas, primarily, primarily the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC. So the FARC doubled their troops in the 1990s, expanded their military operations. They were one of many actors who benefited tremendously from the restructuring of Colombia's role in the drug trade. And beginning in 1996, guerrilla attacks against garrisons, uh, military garrisons, resulted in high military ca um, casualties and growing predictions that the Colombian military was in inadequate to the task of civil defense. And so these paramilitary groups were going to be the solution. Um, and so I've been conducting research with um, wealthy residents of one of the paramilitary strongholds um, along the uh, Atlantic coast, and I've heard many times how paramilitaries had saved the region. Uh, when the paramilitaries called, uh, people took up the cause, one bank executive told me. Each farm had its own group. The paramilitaries saved us from drowning. So they both recall this as a period when the paramilitaries um, really stepped up and um, provided them the security they needed. Now, the use of extrajudicial violence by elites to ensure their economic and political interests has a very long history in Colombia. Um, but I'm going to be really focusing on this period from the mid-'80s to the early 2000s. Um, and while much remains to be written, there's a growing body of work that really focuses on this paramilitary groups and these very complex regional entanglements between local paramilitary commanders regional businesses, multinational corporations, uh, primary among them Chiquita Banana, um, who was actually sanctioned by the U.S. government for their payoffs um, to paramilitary groups, political elites, um, politicians, and military command structures. Um, but what's interesting to me is the ways in which paramilitary commanders it worked at the juncture of the illegal economy and the counterinsurgency efforts of the Colombian government. I mean, they were linked to economic, um, primarily drug trafficking, and counterinsurgency projects were linked in critical ways as drug traffickers became the owners of massive tracts of land and were targeted for guerrilla violence and extortion. Um, at the same time, paramilitary forces were used as the foundation of counterinsurgency efforts operating outside the law but officially sanctioned by the state. And I argue that the emergence of Colombian paramilitary armies as counterinsurgency forces in the late 1990s um, was as a form of proxy violence for the state. And that these forces must be understood in the context of the privatization of state security functions in a range of realms, um, including private security guards, military entrepreneurs, but in this case really focusing on counterinsurgency efforts. Um, and proxies, state proxies work in a number of different fields and are part of kind of what anthropologists talk about more broadly is the lib neoliberal restructuring of the state in which some duties, um, some state functions are assigned to these proxy um, agencies or organizations, but they're not subject to the same kinds of oversight or responsibilities that um, citizen state dynamics require. So paramilitary forces took up the role of the state in several key arenas. They acted in lieu of the state by exercising governance, restricting mo movement, mandating appropriate behavior. So in some areas where paramilitaries control, they would actually regulate clothing that women wore or the kinds of Christmas decorations you could put up in front of your house, um, adjudicating local conflicts. Um, so if you had a fight with your neighbor, if you were beating your wife, the paramilitary commander would intervene. But more importantly, by acting in concert with the state, um, in close and deliberate alliance with military and police forces carrying out these counterinsurgency campaigns. 
1997, paramilitary leaders announced the creation of a new national coordinating body, the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, um, to an, and a new expanded counterinsurgency strategy in which they would be carrying out offensive military operations into new parts of the country. They created new mobile squads with elite training and combat units. Paramilitaries set up bases in these new regions occupied small towns with local military commanders providing close coordination and logistical support for these operations. And during this period, according to Colombian government statistics, the AUC committed more than 900 massacres. So this is from 1997 to 2002. In typical Colombian black humor, the paramilitaries became known as the armed branch of the army. So while soldiers were at home in the barracks, um, or occupying small towns after they had been pacified, the paramilitaries were fighting the counterinsurgency war by targeting civilians. So they were really focused on breaking the civilian supply chains of the guerrillas. Throughout the country, survivors uh, described military forces scouting region, the region prior to paramilitary attacks, blocking escape routes when people attempted to flee. Military officers would themselves tell villagers that the paramilitaries were on their way, referencing the spectacularly brutal violence these groups employed, which included public acts of torture and dismemberment committed with acid, machetes, and um, chainsaws. And in some regions, these groups are actually known as the chainsawers, which sounds a little different in, in Spanish. but. Um, in many group cases, Colombian paramilitary and military forces carried out joint patrols. They were seen drinking and socializing together in small towns throughout the country. Um, so this was clearly part of a concerted counterinsurgency strategy. Now, I'm arguing that government security officers supported these paramilitary counterinsurgency operations, not in spite of their public claims to be transparent, accountable, and professional military forces, but because of the strategic imperative for extreme violence and counterinsurgency operation coexisting with their international entanglements that required them to perform transparency, accountability, and professionalism. And this need, the need for this uh, performance came from their U.S. funders and the demand that they comply with human rights legislation that was written into foreign assistance. So over the, in the prior three decades, um, there was an increasingly consolidated human rights regime championed by significant sectors, but not all, <laughs> of the U.S. government and written into legislation. Um, and this, these human rights standards demanded transparency, professional military practices, and really um, excluded the possibility of excessive violence and demonstrating their worthiness to their U.S. patrons, particularly those congressional representatives who were supportive of this human rights legislation, required evidence of this professionalism and the rejection of extra-legal violence. And these paramilitary proxies allowed, US, um, allowed the Colombian military forces plausible deniability. So in 1997, the same year as the National Paramilitary Coordinating Body was founded, the U.S. passed, the Congress passed the Leahy Law which prohibited foreign military units facing credible allegations of abuses from receiving U.S. military assistance. And as they began vetting um, these units, as they were ramping up this dramatic increase in military aid that came with Plant Columbia, the U.S. found they could not find any units that met this criteria. So rather than saying, hey, maybe we should think about a little systemic reform here, they said, um, we're going to change our strategy for the delivery of military aid. So they decided to focus on creating clean units out of vetted individuals to whom accusations could not be attached by name and whose career advancement required passing this human rights screening. So in Washington, paramilitaries were a policy problem because of the allegations of links between Colombian forces and paramilitary groups meant that the Leahy law could be triggered freezing or actually requiring them to cut off military aid. So their strategy was um, to consistently minimize the paramilitary forces, their role in the conflict. So the conflict was described as between the government and the guerrillas. Um, and to describe the role of the Colombian state as one of absence. And this mapped very neatly on 
the emerging category of the absent and failing state, which had gained a lot of political traction um, in this period in Washington. Coming from political scientist um, I. William Zartman, his work on the failed state in Africa, and this idea that states could be failed or failing began to be very attractive. There's a failing state index that's produced where they're ranked. And in this view, um, warlords produced, driven by criminal pursuit of profit replaced the ideological divide that had characterized the Cold War. And these warlords now control territory and populations because of the lack of state institutions. Um, and this label represented, uh, reflected a post-development paradigm. So before, you, could know, you, um, you would see an upward trajectory. So states were developed or developing. They're on their way. Um, and now, some are seem to have missed the opportunity for this, and they're failed or failing. And absent states are um, kind of very closely related to this idea of failing states. Um, so for Colum U.S. analysts, Colombia became one of the many states countries considered through this framework. So U.S. Defense, Defense Department officials would just tell me that Colombia is sliding off the table. We're going to lose it um, in this language of failing states. Um, and so for U.S. policymakers required to certify the professionalism and accountability to Colombian security forces, the Colombian official denials of links between paramilitary groups fit neatly into this narrative that uh, the Colombian government was simply absent, not aligned with paramilitary forces. Um, paramilitary groups were also sympathetically described by pundits and analysts, such as the National Defense University professor who wrote in a report published by the U.S. Army War College, Colombian paramilitaries, criminals, or political force. I quote, the atrocities of the paramilitaries are not the acts of abnormal men, but rather the acts of normal men subjected to and victimized by unrelenting violence, who see the disappearance of the guerrillas as the only sure solution to their plight. And in interviews with uh, senior state and Defense Department officials, they said that they just didn't know what was going on with the paramilitaries because they didn't have intelligence on them, um, because they were focused on the guerrillas or they were working with their Colombian partners in the Colombian military intelligence service who remarkably didn't have any intelligence on the paramilitaries either. Um, so Brian Sheridan, who was um, at the time the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, um, told me that the Defense Intelligence Agency was focusing on counterinsurgency, tracking every attack, every movement, all the weapons. But when I asked him about the paramilitaries, he said, I just wait for the human rights groups to come to me with evidence. Um, so WOLA, Human Rights Watch, I say, give me some evidence, something I can sink my teeth into. Apart from that, I'm inclined, uh, inclined to adopt a more conventional view of them as isolated incidents. Um, and then uh, U.S. military personnel and their civilian advisors would also um, re resort to a logic of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they're attacking the guerrillas. Um, so who are we going to go after first? It's logical that we wouldn't be concerned about them. Um, so now I'm going to turn to the Colombian official state policy, which was that this violence was illegal, but more that this violence, that these links between Colombian paramilitaries and the security forces did not exist. So their official policy was denial. Um, and they would perform this denial in press conferences, in private meetings, in policy documents, in written responses to accusations. They denied the existence of pervasive links between paramilitary groups and the security forces. And they insisted that they were unaware of this violence and that they were incapable of monitoring these remote regions. To the international community, such claims were presented as evidence of state innocence overpowered by illegal agents, minimal resources and little support. The state was seeking to fulfill its duties but was simply unable to do so. But what was the work that these denials did in rural Colombia where these paramilitary groups were operating? So for rural residents of Colombia living under paramilitary dominion, witness to the pervasive links between these forces, these denials circulated as a form of state terror. So during this period, the paramilitaries allowed the state to present a two-sided mask, modern and accountable to its international um, sponsors, terrorizing and authoritarian for the rural re residents, the state viewed as criminal guerrilla supporters. Um, 
And this was because of the critical role these denials played in these encounters between citizens and officials. So they would have meetings with local residents where state officials claimed that they didn't know about this violence and demanding that local residents themselves inform the state about what was happening in these regions. Facing demands that they collaborate with official requests for information, rural residents were required, one, to deny their daily experiences of violence, but also put in this impossible position of facing the very people who were, in many cases, responsible for the violence against them. So one place this happened were local security council meetings, consejos de seguridad, which were convened in the departmental level or municipal level and included all the civilian and military authorities of a given region and often many community leaders as well. And they were a key site for this kind of encounter between and with state representatives. And these were called in times of crisis um, and they were for registering complaints and demanding state re redress. But in practice, the majority um, resulted in state denials of paramilitary inclusion in these demands for um, information from residents. And these meetings often resulted in subsequent violence when the people who had actually responded to these demands for information were targeted for retaliatory violence. So these spaces were unavailable to me as an anthropologist, but when I was traveling, I, I've spent the last, um, since 1999, going back to Putumayo every year and um, conducting interviews. So through the arrival of the paramilitaries, the height of the violence, and then now kind of in the post-violence <coughs> period, um, interviewing local civilian officials, priests, and military officers in the region about these encounters. Um, but these encounters were also registered in, in official mil, uh, military records and documents that were photocopied and circulated by military officers as part of their human rights files. Um, so they would give them, military officers would give them to me as part of their demonstration of their human rights professionalism. So one example is a file that begins with an urgent action. So this is a, um, a complaint of paramilitary violence from a Bogota-based NGO. And then it includes the minutes from this Consejo de Seguridad, this security council that was called to address the situation um, that was mentioned in the urgent action. So the first, is a lo the first um, line in the minutes is that the local priest says that, um, asks that no one talk about the violence in the region because it's too dangerous. And then there's a blank line. And then the paramilitaries, uh, I'm sorry, the military commanders, the local officials, and community representatives um, are discussing the, pop the possibility of construction of a military base, the need for military operations, and the need for local support. A military commander says, asks if the community has denounced the events involving illegal armed groups, stating that it is important that the community collaborates and denounces. And then the priest asks again, who is going to provide security for anyone who, um, who, who issues a, a complaint about this violence? Um, and then the, a local, it concludes with saying no denuncias or no complaints have been reported. And then there, there's a, a report of the, fi the file concludes with the official report from an army officer um, that has no mention of the, the priest's concern and basically says the local population is asking for another military base. So I heard a similar story from a priest, so not the same case, but a similar one, who reported that his confrontation with a military commander during a Consejo de Seguridad about his troops participation in paramilitary violence and extrajudicial ex executions led to death threats against him and he was actually forced to flee the region. Official claims of ignorance and demands for additional information also circulated among government agencies um, and, and in the form of memos. So many local ombudsmen, personeros, and other civilian officials would get requests from other officials saying, we've heard that there are paramilitary groups in the region. Can you tell us about them? Who are they? Where do they work? Um, and these personeros would describe being feeling absolutely panicked um, when they got these requests for information as well as feeling frustration that they were unable to fulfill their mandate of assisting threatened and victimized local residents. 
So one personero described the local government prosecutor as playing hot potato with the issue. So she would send these memos saying there were reports of paramilitary activity. We needed to certify what criminal acts were being committed. Um, but he described this as endangering everyone. The situation of public order is known by all institutions here, he said, yet they all pretend during the Consejo de Seguridad that if someone talks about the presence of paramilitaries, it's the latest news flash. Um, so I heard similar stories in many, many small towns. And these also occurred in big, large public meetings. So the military officers would come into town in the central plaza and convene um, public meetings demanding that local residents give them evidence about any kind of paramilitary activity that was happened, make them sign documents saying that, they, that there was no paramilitary activity, and then would use this to counteract um, um, reports by Bogota-based and international NG human rights NGOs. So I argue that this functions as a form of state terror because of the ways in which local residents are positioned as both um, the targets of daily violence by these actors, but then forced to publicly erase this violence before the state or fear further retaliatory violence. And that this kind of tactic, like many of the kinds of tactics involving state terror, like disappearances, is organized around not just denial, but the actual eraser of the, erasure of the criminal act itself um, by the people and for the people to whom this violence is being committed. And I argue that this is only visible if you're doing the kind of in-depth, sustained ethnographic engagement with the kinds of communities that are um, experiencing these kinds of policy interventions. So I'm just going to conclude with a couple notes of why I think it's important to do this kind of work. Um, so first, I think it's really important to think about the Colombian paramilitaries because understanding their origins, um, impact, and legacies is one, if not the central, well, it's not the central, but one of the central questions in contemporary political life in Colombia. So what has been the impact? How do we understand that? What's the obligation to the people who survived that? How do they continue to operate in contemporary life? For us, as US citizens or US-based um, academics, um, it's very important to understand this history because pundits and policymakers in Washington have heralded Plan Colombia as a fantastic success. This was the plan that brought Colombia back from the brink. It would be a model for our best hope in Iraq, Robert Kaplan famously, in my mind, wrote. Um, and it's now a model for U.S. efforts in Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Mexico, and elsewhere. So the U.S. is paying for um, the Colombian, in another way to get around the Leahy laws, the U.S. is now um, paying the Colombian military to train forces that, from other countries that will not pass the Leahy law. So using the Colombian military now as U.S. proxies. Um, but what kind of nation were we building in Colombia? Uh, what kind of accountability can we imagine for those involved in the violence that Colombians suffered during this process is an open and urgent question, and particularly in the context of the current peace talks with the guerrillas, where there is the opportunity to really um, think about what accountability means in this very complex political field, but then also what kinds of government programs can we imagine that would redress them. And finally, I want to make an argument that I think an anthropology of policy is particularly well positioned for thinking about these issues for all of the reasons that I have laid out, because of the broadness of the questions and the political field that we keep within our view, and because of the kind of deep engagement with place that anthropologists have traditionally encouraged. So thinking about um, not just immersive field work for periods of you know, a year or six months, but going back to a place over the course of a decade two decades, how can that change how we analyze the long life of these policy interventions? Thank you. Yes. So, um, are there any questions? 
think um, you have greatly outlined how the use of paramilitaries by both the US government and Colombian government is deeply destructive, but I'm just wondering this as a model, would you completely discount it, or are there certain guidelines, certain models which can be used to produce constructive and ethical outcomes in your opinion? In terms of the use of paramilitary forces by encountering insurgency campaigns? Uh, well, the use of what is called by many military theorists of indigenous irregulars has a long history in counterinsurgency campaigns. Um, and in fact, when the U.S. rewrote the counterinsurgency doctrine in 2009, you remember that? Um, they keep that on the table, and certainly there were a number of military strategists who advocated that without those kinds of military um, indigenous irregulars, you, you would not be effective for the guerrillas. During this period, and it's a very complex history, so I didn't get into all of it, but the Colombian government actually legalized paramilitary groups called the Convivid, which were um, legally empowered to work with local military, receive military training and weapons. Um, but for example, in the, the Chiquita Banana case, um, the these Convivid groups quickly became front groups for receiving money that they channeled to the illegal paramilitary groups that were conducting this violence. Um, I think in terms of what I would argue about is there a way in which you could imagine these groups perf performing according to some kind of human rights standard, I find it in the context of these existing structures and violences, I think it would be almost impossible to think about how that could be achieved um, because of this long history of the use of violence um, by elites and paramilitary forces. Um, and I also think if you look historically at the counterinsurgency efforts in Latin America, they have not stayed within kind of what we would think of as the confines of legal counterinsurgency doctrine. And even that as we see within the United States with the debates over torture, also known as enhanced interrogation, that lines can become very slippery in wartime contexts and behaviors can be justified in terms of national security that I would argue ultimately undermine it in the long term, but do coexist within legal frameworks. So I guess one question is about the um, about the Leahy law, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I heard you. I think I heard you say, um, Le Le the Leahy law almost causes the double. It gotta causes this kind of double. Um, this doing one thing with the military and, and kind of a unofficial policy doing something else with the with the, with the paramilitaries. Is there a way that Leahy could have been implemented <laughs> differently, written differently? Are there? Um, is it about that? That's a flawed policy, which, which I, a lot of human rights folks kind of use as one of the only um, uh, kind of effective policy, um, um, effective policies for human rights. Or mm -hmm. is it kind of a, or do you reject it kind of in the end? Is it is it inherently flawed and kind of destined to? Are there what are the normal implications? Does it is it inherently flawed? And That the, that the peas are carrying out, it's going to happen. Um, so I guess I'll start there. <laughs> yeah, so the Leahy case, I mean, I worked on lobbying for the Leahy law. I worked on supporting implementation. Um, some of my best friends support the Leahy law. Um, and I think it's very important to have a very clear view of causality. The Leahy law did not cause okay. the paramilitaries. The, the paramilitaries were caused by people who wanted to conduct these kind of counterinsurgency um, operations and weren't, I think, and weren't going to let the Leahy law stand in their way. So the, the, the responsibility, I think, rests with the military, U U.S. and Colombian, who prioritized um, military aid and military operations over systemic reform. So I want to locate that responsibility there. I think, um, I mean, I think a lot of how I would answer the rest of the question has to do less with my field work and more with my own personal political convictions, which are big tent, but so we need radicals pushing it, and we need moderates who are lobbying for Leahy and working on implementation. Um, there were a number of activists that I interviewed for this project who did reject Leahy and rejected the whole idea that you could lobby, I mean, kind of going back to the first question, 
to say, to say that you could put any kind of framework, I mean, there are pacifists who say we shouldn't have military aid at all. There are people who say any kind of military aid to the Colombian military in this context without systemic reform is ridiculous and insane. Um, but I also think um, that the supporters of Leahy argue that it kept human rights on the table in a particular way, and it gave a vehicle for advancing on individual cases that were very important. It gave leverage to people who were arguing, we need these military guys out. <laughs> we, need the, we need to see some progress on these things. Um, it, the, I mean, there are all kinds of perverse incentives that happen in Colombia, as you well know and are documenting in your own work, the case of the so-called false positives, the body count scandal. So as they were asking for um, greater numbers of guerrilla kills, the Colombian military was going out and uh, murdering young men from poor neighborhoods and presenting them as guerrillas killed in combat. Um, and this was happening all throughout the period when the U.S. was supposedly applying its strongest pressure for professionalism, professionalization. Um, so I'm also, well, there's two things. One is I think we have to be attuned to the unintended consequences, whether or not it fits our political hopes and dreams. And so, I mean, part of this book came out of, as a human rights person, wanting to understand how I mean, feeling very much myself that I failed, you know, going to Southern Columbia, being there and seeing people in towns being taken over by paramilitaries, coming back the next year and being like, yeah, they killed 45 guys and threw them in the river, like being part of that process was tremendously difficult and um, shocking to me. So there's that part of it. Um, but then there's also the part of the long view of history, like the story goes on. And so this has nothing to do with the Leahy Law, but right now what everybody's worried about in Putumayo is oil exploration. And you go back down right now and they're like, yeah, you know, nobody's killing us, but we have no water <laughs> and the river is full of like contamination. And so we're gonna have a march for the river now. So it's, you know, the story doesn't end, it goes on and on. Um, and I think for the people who are concerned about Leahy, it becomes, again, coming back to the United States and saying, well, how is this being used? How are the Colombians being used as now as proxies for the U.S. in these other situations? Um, I do think this clearly shows the degree to which militarization and military intervention has become a dominant logic of U.S. policy. And you can try to put a stone in that shoe, but <laughs> it's a very powerful machine. And, um, you know, thinking about who the people were that put that in place, where they are now. So, Peter, did you have a question? Yes. Great job. Um, what's fascinating to me about your talk is how little you actually said about drug production, drug trafficking, given that on the U.S. side of the political equation, the politics of drug control and the war on drugs yeah. drive so much of U.S. Columbia policy. And so, you know, to me, the, the, the trick that happened, if you call it a trick, was that the politics determined that it has to be a drug story, yeah. but that this national security strategist understands it's a counterinsurgency story, so they were to sell it to Congress and the American people that were doing counter-narcotics. Still, they have to sell it. it. Has to be still has to be a drug story. The headlines still have to be about drugs. And from the strategist's perspective, the whole thing was in fact a success. It wasn't just celebrating. I mean, the FARC has been pushed way back, right? So, but it was done through drugging. Yeah. So, can you say more about that? Mm -hmm. Because you know, are we supposed? To, all right. One way to put it in terms of a question. Are policymakers, U.S. policymakers, dupes? They were duped into providing drug aid, which is really counterinsurgency, or are they hyper cynical, knowing full well that this is uh, drug aid? Uh, actually, it's, it's counterinsurgency aid masquerading as drug aid. Uh, the stupid or evil question? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
the answer, well, certainly I agree that the way that this has been talked about as a success is it was a success at nation building and defeating the FARC. And all of these reports that I mentioned say, yeah, so we didn't do that much about coca or cocaine coming to the United States. Our bad, basically. But Colombia is doing really great. And now, as I was mentioning, the only risk is you'll want to stay, which is the Colombian government's <laughs> official tourism slogan. Um, so, first of all, I think there was, um, because of the way that the drug story was told in the United States, the FARC was positioned as the major player. So all the guys in the Defense Intelligence Agency made the, told the story of the Colombian drug trade. Well, first it was Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel, and there was some stuff with the Cali cartel, and then the FARC took over. Like, that's the story that they told. And when, you, when I went down to um, the U.S. Southern Command, that's the story that they told. They didn't tell a story about Carlos Castaño or the Northern Valle Cartel or any of the people that actually took <laughs> over the drug trade. That's the story that they told. And so they were, I think, um, the kind of very powerful melding of this narco guerrilla figure. <laughs> Um, I think was very motivating. It was like the perfect enemy. They're communists and they're drug traffickers. Like, how, what else could you want in your <laughs> arch enemy? Um, and I Terrorist. tell, sorry? Terrorist. They got that well, they got that. I mean, this is a story that happened before 9 11. And there is an interesting pop culture reference, um, which was, oh, I'm going to forget the name of it, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. No, 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 no. There was one that, he, that was supposed to come out on September 20th, 2001. And Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a firefighter whose wife and child are killed when a Colombian guerrilla blows up their building in Los Angeles. And he goes down to Colombia to find El Lobo and his wife, those Colombian narco guerrillas, who are responsible for this terrorist attack. Collateral Damage <laughs> is the name of this movie. Obviously, it was not released <laughs> in September of 2001, but this is like a, re a reflection of all of this effort to position the guerrillas in that way. So that would be the first way that I would answer that question. The second is that there was a counterinsurgency strategy that, that involved, um, the logic was if we cut off coca, then the guerrillas won't have any money, and that will be a way of two birds with one stone. So you keep both of the things in the frame. Um, cocoa reduction and um, kind of counterinsurgency. And I think, I mean, in terms of how, I've made a very conscious decision to try to stay away from parsing their inner motivations because I can't know what is in the heart of um, these members of Congress as they were doing this. And I think there was the full gamut. Um, you could, what I did do was how, amazingly excited and impressed they were when they came back from their three-day tour in the um, helicopters over the jungle and got to fire the mini guns and rip out coca with their bare hands and set it on fire. I mean, that was tremendously exciting to many primarily young men, male staffers in U.S. Congress, and um, the pictures of themselves with these um, helicopters was very motivating. I mean, there was also famously, the helicopter debate. So the debate in the Senate over Plan Columbia was not about drugs <laughs> or counterinsurgency. It was about who would get to build the helicopters, what congressional districts. Was it going to be Sikorsky in Connecticut or Bell in Texas? And this was the pretty much the entire two-hour debate. <laughs> um, so there's all of those ways in which people kind of slot themselves into this. Um, Story. I mean, I think when you listen, the fact that, you know, President Bill Clinton for many years wore a woven bracelet on his arm and the colors of the Colombian flag because he felt so much like this was an incredibly important legacy, I think speaks to both the emotional dimension of this, but the ways in which they bought into the story that these elite Colombians were playing. I mean, one of the things I don't talk, I didn't talk about in this at all was that this really mapped onto a story that they were sold not just by the U.S. military guys, but by the Colombian elites who were like, we want to we do some serious counterinsurgency damage. And 
Um, they were very compelling, Pastrana and his Moreno, the <coughs> Colombian ambassador. Um, so I really kind of stepped back from the like, were they willing dupes question. Um, that's not that satisfying, I would say. Yeah? lasting legacies of um, what you argued is state terror on the local communities. Um, the specific question I have, um, I'm in political science, I'm interested in the long-lasting political effects, and especially since you went back over a long period of time. Um, and as you said, the story goes on, and something you said made me think that perhaps this um, period had some type of impact on political culture or or, you know, does it go up, does it go down, is it changed? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, so I think this, that is a very regional story. So one of the lasting legacies is that the kind of, the nature of the Colombian land tenure has been transformed. So that's a real way. Money has moved from the pockets of poor people into the pockets of rich people. Um, so that's a pretty common story. Um, the dramatic depopulation of rural land and it's being taken over by paramilitaries, their kind of allies, that's part of this story um, that hasn't really been written about, um, but is a huge issue because of the um, land restitution program that the Colombian government is currently entering into. And that's really where you see um, a lot of the political violence right now is against people trying to reclaim land and organize around um, going back to the land. Um, in terms of political participation more broadly, um, this violence was very rural. And I think one of the things that's happened is it p continued this long past half century of urbanization in Colombia, so it's really changed the face of the country in that way. And in different areas, um, this kind of state terror has had a really different impact. So when I'm going to the northern coast, um, where many of these drug trafficking paramilitaries were um, from and where they settled, as opposed to the areas they went into and conquered from the guerrillas, uh, people are waiting for the next warlord, basically. They're like, we need somebody to come in here and put things in order. There is, it was a really scorched earth policy with civil society. Um, so people are really not involved in any of the kinds of things that we would think about as, as civil society. Um, this is actually the thing that I'm looking at for my next project. So one of the things I'm trying to think through is, um, they have all these state modernization programs. So they have a huge initiative for Afro-Colombian political participation, for LGBT and trans political participation in a town where 10 years ago, if you were an openly gay person, the paramilitaries would kill you on the street. Now the mayor's office has like an LBGT office and you can come in and talk to them about your community group. I mean, it's just absolutely astounding. And very confusing, like, what does this actually mean? What does it actually do? Um, so I'm trying to think through that right now. Um, in other areas, like in Southern Columbia, where I worked, that had a much longer guerrilla presence and paramilitary incursions, um, I think this is what's gonna happen with the peace process is a critical part of this story. Like, what is the impact of this? But how people view the state obviously is part of this, and when you're the object of this kind of um, state violence, like people are not really gung-ho <laughs> about the possibilities of political participation. And there's also all of these ways in which this terror becomes a free-floating political resource for people. So you can send somebody, I have the oldest phone in the world, uh, but you can send somebody a text message now that says, if you, and I talked to local politicians who'd say, I get these anonymous threats. If you have this hearing on um, zoning in your neighborhood, your family's gonna be killed. They don't know who it's from. It could be one guy. <laughs> but it's enough to make people really pull back because they have this, they had this experience. Um, so there are all these pamphlets being circulated around, photocopies, you know, the 
the black army is going to kill everybody who, you know, brings somebody around after 6 p.m. You don't know. That could be one guy. Or it could be a network of death squads that's going to take over your town. So that really changes the way people can operate as well. Yes. and connecting that to an archive of state terror and erasure and that, you know, looking at that case file and using that as something you unpack and make those connections. And I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit about your own, you know, you've given us a sense of how you did the ethnography itself. So a very kind of, I think we've got a sense of that kind of multi-scalar labor. But I wondered if you could reflect a little bit about the writing then and how as an anthropologist you decide to how you want to structure that story and how you want to tell it ethnographically wading into an area that, I mean, I don't know if people know, but the anthropology of policy making is relatively, in the grand scheme of things, relatively new. And so if you could reflect a little bit about your writing choices and your representational choices and how you decided to weave these things together, which I'm sure once I read it, will be much more clear to me. <laughs> but it's nice to hear from the person, too. Oh, yeah. No. Um, yeah. How did I write? It's all a big blur. <laughs> um, no, so one of the things that's challenging about this book is one, you're writing about public people. And the other is that you're writing about people, in some cases, who are very used to dealing with journalists. So a lot of the conversations were very different than other ethnographic fieldwork I did. So they'd be like, okay, this is deep background, this is on the record, this is off the record. Um, and they would also be like, I'm not going to talk to you unless you pay $500 for my hour of, because a lot of these guys are political consultants now. Like, I tried to talk to Barry McCaffrey, um, who was the drug czar, and his office was like, he has no slots available for the next two years. <laughs> and I was like, OK, then. <laughs> um, so that's part of thinking about then how to represent them, because a lot, of people, a lot of people would say, you can cite me, but only as a senior Defense Department official. They would actually tell me how to represent them. Um, so that was a little bit easier. Part of it was getting, and I write about this, I didn't want to, and I was thinking about trying to bring in pictures, but the exciting pictures are the pictures from Columbia. They're like pictures of paramilitaries and like coca plants. And then I have like a picture of the State Department. And it's <laughs> like, it doesn't feel, it's getting that ethnographic texture is much more difficult. Because when I was talking to women in Southern Columbia, we would hang out and we would drink beer and we would eat soup that they would cook over open fires. And it felt like ethnography. When I was talking to State Department officials, I would be meeting in a Starbucks. And they would be like, well, this is, you know, it's a very different sense. So that was something that I struggled with, um, kind of the ways in which the sensory experience that I argue is important and compelling gets stripped out. Because I couldn't go on the drugs and thugs tour. That was just stuff that people told me about. So it becomes partially an oral history kind of story. Um, I'm very attuned to the fact that this is a particular accounting of Plan Columbia. So there are other ways to tell this story. So there was a whole kind of alternative development story um, that was part of this that I really don't touch on. But I tried to balance it very much from like the ways in which people in Southern Columbia, like what they were thinking and experiencing, and then keeping um, kind of all of these things in the frame at the same time. Um, and I do that through the stories of Columbians that came to Washington, but then also what was going on um, in Southern Columbia. Um, it's very much written for a US audience. So I was trying to, like, how can I tell about this incredibly complicated history of paramilitary groups in a way that's useful? It's now being translated into Spanish. So it's going to be interesting how it circulates in Colombia. And I was talking to the translators. Um, and I was like, well, do you need all this stuff about Putumayo? And they're like, nobody in Bogota knows anything about Putumayo. Like, you got to keep all that detail in there, too. Um, so I'm trying to think what else would be interesting or useful. It was incredibly difficult. Like, I was rearranging it up until, like, the day that I submitted the manuscript, basically. It was very hard to figure out sort of how to keep it all together. But 
It's kind of like musical chairs. This is when the music stops, so I set it in, and here it is. <laughs> um, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Again, it was really thought provoking, and I had a question about um, the use of the word thought. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, trying to, I'm just curious about how you um, define or operationalize thug in a landscape of transnational thuggery. <laughs> yeah, that's a, um, an interesting question. And that was something that I had a question about, too. There was kind of as the book was going to press, the debate around the racist connotations and history of thug became part of the US public conversation. And I talked to the publisher. I was like, should we use this? Should we change it? And they were like, we're going to do it. So part of it was out of my control. <laughs> Um, but what I wanted, what it originally came out of a sense of the ways in which um, a broader field, certain kinds of people are criminalized and other kinds of people aren't. So one of the things that I track throughout the book is the ways in which who is visible as a thug in the transnational drug trade and who is not, and the whole issue of peasant farmers who grow coca who are desperately trying to portray themselves as peasant farmers but are be seen, being seen as drug trafficking thugs in, and described that way by US officials um, in, as they design the kind of programs that are going to be targeting them. Um, so part of it was to keep it as an open category and track its political uses and how it circulates in the process of this policy making, um, who it, it's applied to and how. And it also rhymes. <laughs> Part of it. <laughs> yes. I have two questions. One, which I guess we could talk about later, it's about emotions. And I was wondering if you could uh, provide some examples mm -hmm. about how this emotional transformation happens. Um, and the other one is about the flow of information and how you claim that, or that you argue in your book that. Uh, new law, um, the Lehi law, actually created this idea of state terror because of the cleavage between what the U.S. was demanding in, you know, regarding human rights and what was actually happening on the field. But I'm wondering if that cleavage isn't, uh, it's always happened in the field between the center, the capital city, and what happens in the field, in, you know, in the north, in the south, in the west, everywhere in Colombia. So that cleavage has always existed, and we could actually claim that human rights culture in Colombia was not even that much of a thing in the mid-90s, right? So I guess well, that's one thing that I want to even, I, want, I wondered if you could comment on. And the other one is, given your... Wait, isn't that already two questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, this is like... <laughs> To be. Can you wait? Let me do the first one, and then we can come back. And, okay. Because otherwise, I'll forget. Okay. So emotion. Uh, so the importance of emotion really came to me when I was working as an advocate, and people kept telling me I was concerned with the wrong people, and I was sad about the wrong people getting killed. So this this refrain that you're crying about peasants being massacred, but you never say anything about the police being killed and the soldiers being killed and the um, people being kidnapped. So that, the idea that you're grieving for the wrong people, that you are emotionally committed to um, the wrong categories, um, really struck with me. And this, um, there was a series of congressional hearings um, that got quite heated um, in the late 1990s where um, Bob Barr and Dennis Hastert and others would, uh, were talking to the U.S. ambassadors and they were like, you've got the blood of Colombian police on your hands because you're not sending this military aid because of these human rights restrictions. Um, you know, people are dying in the streets and very vivid emotional language. Um, so when I went back as an ethnographer, I was asking people like, what got you committed to this? Well, I went on a drugs and thugs tour. And a lot, several of the key staffers were actually former policemen or very committed. Uh, there was one particular, John Mackey, um, whose two favorite, he was an um, Irish-American guy. 
And his two favorite causes were the IRA and the Columbia National Police. <laughs> and, um, and he would talk in this very emotional language, like he would always go to the hospital where the wounded policemen were and visit them and describing the emotional impact of seeing these young men's bodies in very vivid language. Um, and so I started asking people about that and about that experience, the experience of um, these trips in particular and the idea that travel um, engenders these kinds of emotional commitments um, that become political commitments. And this is not unfamiliar. I mean, as a solidarity activist, I mean, that's the whole idea behind Witness for Peace. You bring people to these trips and they see things and they become changed and then they go back and become political activists. So what was interesting to me is that the other side was doing it too. And they were doing it in very calculated ways. So they would target people and say, we've got to get this guy down because he's voting the wrong way. And once he sees people, um, Jim McGovern, who was one of the big, uh, from here in Massachusetts, one of the big critics of Plan Columbia, um, would describe, you know, you're, you're in these very intimate personal spaces. People are asking things of you. You, you become, as a politician, committed to certain things. And, and so becoming attuned to how that emotional dynamic happens um, and, and arguing that it happens both for policymakers but also for um, solidarity activists, I think, is a critical part for understanding how people's allegiances were developed and their, their commitments during that time. So that's kind of the primary example. Um, so I am, in regards to your second question, I'm in no way arguing that, that state terror is new or that the cleavage between the center and the periphery in Columbia is new. Um, I, <laughs> I wrote a book about the Colombian human rights movement in the 1990s called Counting the Dead. Um, and I argue, I mean, it was, the human rights movement there was pretty marginal, but um, I guess I think played a, a key role in connecting transnationally at certain moments. The argument that I'm trying to make about state terror is that it produced a new form of, and pr new practices that functioned as forms of state terror. So to my knowledge, it was not, there was not the practice of military officers going into a town and making people sign letters saying, there is nothing happening in our town in response to human rights um, complaints and reports. Um, and when I think, um, so I did a series of, mil of interviews with military officers that I write about in Counting the Dead, and they would speak openly. They'd say, we can't go and fight anymore because of human rights, because our careers will be over if we get accused of human rights violations, and that's why we can't do anything. And so it was something that they were very aware of, very concerned about, um, and there were a few, very few, but interestingly, um, so the first high-ranking officer was a general by the name of um, Valandia, Hurtado Valandia, who was relieved from duty for being in charge, in 1995, for being in charge of the um, military intelligence battalion that disappeared an M-19 guerrilla named Erica Bautista. And he became the head of the Retired Military Officers Association and um, played a very, um, I think, pivotal role in engendering this military fear of human rights and serving as the poster child for what happened. Um, and there was this sense that, you know, they could not, you know, the, the idea that you would be denied U.S. military training had real impact on people's careers. And it meant that you didn't get the promotions, but you also didn't get the rewards. There was a whole reward system built into that in terms of how U.S. military training works. Um, so I do think it was circulating at that time in a very different way among the officers less in these small towns. I mean, people in the small towns were like, we don't know about human rights, we don't care, but that within the um, state agencies, that was um, a concern. So, that, so that's the first two pieces, and then you had a third piece of the question. Uh, oh, <laughs> see, it worked. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. 
interesting talk. I'm wondering if you could, you sounded a little skeptical of the idea that policymakers, especially maybe on the ground policymakers, could act in sort of the objective, detached fashion in implementing uh, chosen policy. I mean, just from my perspective, I spent many years as a CIA case officer in Latin America. Uh, so I wasn't a policymaker, but I spent time with policymakers. And I was always impressed by uh, the professionalization of the diplomatic corps, of the military officers, and their ability to, I mean, of course, they're influenced by their emotions. They're ideologically influenced, but they could work across administrations, for example in implementing chosen policy. I mean, I think if you look at someone like Ambassador McKinley, uh, former chief of mission in Bogota, who's really a man of extraordinary erudition, wrote, uh, I think, a couple volume uh, work on the cultural history of Venezuela. I mean, to me, that seems like a man who really can take the chosen policies uh, that are selected ultimately by the American people and then, in a, in a fairly detached way, implement them. So I'm wondering if you just maybe talk a little more about uh, the skepticism you have towards that approach. Um, well, I think I have to first start with a skepticism towards the entire premise of your question. Um, starting with policies being chosen by the American people, all the way back to people being able to operate in an objective way. I mean, I think as anthropologists, we kind of discard the entire notion of objectivity just from the get-go <laughs> and argue really that people are the product of the cultural norms and values that surround them, and so anybody operating anywhere has to be understood in that context. Um, if I mean, I do agree that certainly there are people within the U.S. bureaucracies that are pro deeply intelligent, that are deeply committed to their ethical systems of norms and values, and that are very thoughtful um, about both their role and the histories and contexts in which they're operating. Um, so I'm not disputing that part of your question, but I guess um, I would take issue with the kind of entire framing of the rest of it. So yeah, I guess the, the question is then sort of where does that lead us? We have this naive view, at least I have the naive view. Look, we can have some political system that's going to come to a decision about what policies are important. We're going to have professionals who know about how to implement the policies then go try to do the work. I mean, in your view, is that just sort of... Well, Never I mean, one really of the things that I think when I was writing this book, I was really thinking about that kind of, well, where am I going to come down on the ideal of the idea of political action and what it means both for myself as a scholar, but also for myself as a politically active person. Like, what do I think about this? Um, and I think, um, obviously, I, well, not obviously, but I do argue both as an academic and as a person. <laughs> can separate those things, um, that it is important to be politically engaged and politically involved in the process. One of the many transformations that happened during the course of this book was um, the judgment of Citizens United. And so thinking about the role of money, and um, one of the things when I think back of my own time as an advocate, um, talking to congressional staffers and being like, I have this community activists that I would like you to meet. Well, I'm going to go ride this helicopter <laughs> with Bell Helicopters. I mean, that's not a level playing field in terms of how people are assessing what constitutes an appropriate policy. Um, but uh, having said that, I do hold on to my naive hope that um, we do have enough of the skeleton of a democratic system that participation can impact the political life that we create for ourselves and that we try to um, promote around the world. So I do um, naively kind of end with that hope. <laughs> yeah. Maybe this is another way of getting into some of the things you were touching on. For, to me, the story is a lot about contesting narratives, right? Mm -hmm. And these coexisting, so there's a kind of, the, kind of an idealized clean narrative coming from US policymakers about um, mainly about what, what Peter was talking about. So, the, so this clean frame of, um, of fighting the, the communist terrorist drug traffickers, right? So there's a different narrative that the Colombian elites and the Colombian military are coming up with. And then there's another narrative happening on the ground in the Consejo de Seguridad, which I'd love to actually hear a little bit more about. So I guess one of my questions is about as information is flowing more between those different spheres, somewhat um, with like, kind of more visits, these kind of emotional experiences that policymakers are having both with 
with all different actors. Um, but I don't know, social media or kind of other things. It, it seems like in the story these pretty conflicting narratives are coexisting and they're not they're not butting up against each other and forced to reconcile themselves. Um, so I wonder if you if that's am I reading that right in terms of how I'm understanding that and is that something you think is solid? And I think that goes towards the question of um, if US policymakers in Washington have one narrative, is that being transmitted kind of seamlessly and and being and just kind of being put into practice or how much I mean, yeah, how much when personnel changed in the Bogota office, things really changed in terms of what was happening on the ground. So anyway, so that's maybe. Yeah, no, I mean, to... as an anthropologist, I'm very concerned with, and this book is about the power of stories and the different stories that people are telling and what stories tend to prevail. Um, but all stories are not created equal. And so the story of um, militarization, the stories of you know, who's the enemy, those are very powerful, deeply rooted stories that have a lot of political power behind them. Um, so that's one thing I would say about that. I mean, the other is, I, I really go back and forth with this question of what did people know? I mean, it's kind of going back to Peter's question, what did people know and when did they know it? So when people are saying, you know, when Ambassador Pickering looks me in the eye and says, we didn't have any intelligence on the paramilitaries. Like, part of me is like, that's a stupid or evil question, because that is your job. <laughs> like, that is your job. Um, and this was a time when, you know, everybody in the country had Carlos Castaño's cell phone. I mean, I could have gotten it for him. <laughs> Carlos Castaño was the main kind of paramilitary guy. He was on the, the front page of the Washington Post magazine, King of the Jungle. I mean, this was not a guy that was really hiding out. He was a very serious political player, and the fact that, um, like, I don't know because I don't, I'm not, I'm not privy to that, and those documents are not available to us. What were they really writing about him? I don't know. Um, there was one DEA report that got leaked um, from '97, and they like spelled his name wrong, and we're like, really? <laughs> like, um, so there's that. The other part is, like, I'm really interested, I think the question of the flow of information and the um, particularly social media question is pretty intriguing. Um, so this story is also a story uh, that really took place before the internet and really hit Columbia in a big way. And the people who used the internet the best were the paramilitaries. They had a fabulous website. They had, I mean, the guerrillas were like, had one of those black and white with the yellow flashing little things <laughs> website like, forever. And the paramilitaries were like, would you like to see our organic structure and hear our hymns? And like, you know, would you be interested in talking with one of our, I mean, they were, they had really good advisors and they were very, very smart about public relations. And that helped these stories a lot because it was a, it fit very well um, into these narratives. But I also think, um, you know, I was talking to one of my friends who's a journalist, I think she was here, Sibylla Brzezinski, uh, a couple of years ago, um, I saw one of the posters up there. She writes for The Economist, and she was telling this story about going to Putumayo in 2004 to talk about um, the alternative development stuff and the fumigation stuff. and. Um, she recently co-authored a book of oral histories of violence called Shooting Rolling Stones at the Moon, I think. Um, and she went back and it turned out that one of the women that she interviewed, whose story she t uh, tells in this book, um, was like in that same town being tortured by paramilitaries while she was there talking about um, the alternative development project. And she's like, what, what does it say about me that I didn't even know that story was happening? I mean, that's a, that's a really big question about the media and about kind of how things can happen that, um, I mean, one of the things I think that is so intriguing about the idea of human rights work is, first of all, it's the idea that you can know things are happening. 
And the second is that knowing things are happening will somehow change the happening of them. And I think that's also a really open question <laughs> at this point. That's a really sad way to end. <laughs> I liked it better when I was like, I think on the like, we could be politically active and it'll be great. Um, are we done? We or? have one or two minutes. Oh, okay, anybody have any other questions? <laughs> yes. I'll ask a question about the word frame. So you, you applied it to yourself only uh, in, in this discussion, but I'm wondering what you think about the framing perspective and anthropology's uh, response to it. So I mean, if you read people who aren't anthropologists talking about policy, then framing is a dominant paradigm for understanding what policy does. And my sense from listening to you talk is that you have some dissatisfaction with the framing paradigm. I'd like to hear more about it. Ah, okay. Um, well, my kind of initial use of it is actually more sociological in the social movement literature, the idea that you can frame things in different ways and generate um, political action from that. I am, I mean, I guess my dissatisfaction with it um, is basically about the power of framing and wanting to not completely locate all the power there because you know, I mean, part of it was I'm not an investigative journalist, so I'm not exposing these things. I'm not revealing who got what campaign contributions. Um, and I don't want to discount the materiality of the kind of power that I'm talking about. But what I'm focusing on are is the stories and the framings, and so kind of keeping those th two things in the, in the frame <laughs> um, is important to me, but it's I, I always feel like I'm giving short shrift to these kinds of um, broader power dimensions. And so that's one of the things that I struggle with actually in the writing of this, because it is so focused on the different narratives, how to um, portray the, the ways in which power works, not just through stories, but through all of these other mechanisms. Um, and that's, I'm not sure how successful I was. <laughs> so, buy my book, give it away to your friends and neighbors. <laughs> Thank you.